I'll have you understand that there are only 8,810 promises in the Bible, all right? There's 7,706 in the New Testament and 1,104 promises. That's in the Old Testament and 1,104 uh, in the New Testament. And so picking just four is going to be a challenge, right? But anyway, we're going to do that. But I wonder how many of you believe in the promises of God? You trust in His promises. You trust, even as we sang today, in His faithfulness. You trust in His Word. Amen. And uh, so uh, with that in mind, we've got to understand that it's all about faith. This, this series is going to be about your faith level. It's about your trust level in the Lord, right? In your King. This is about you understanding the very nature of the God whom you serve. So as we begin, I've got just a couple of thoughts for you today. All right. The first thought is this. Number one, Jesus is saying yes to your prayer promise. I said Jesus is saying yes, right? And, you know, there are times that we think that we have to earn the promises of God in order for God to give them. How many know that's false? We can't earn God's grace. No. The promises are given as a result of faith, not on some merit system. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. And there are other times we think, well, I've got to have some kind of a super duper extraordinary type of faith to receive the promise of God. No, you don't. All you need is a little faith, a mustard seed of faith. That's the smallest seed in the, in the, in the, in the, you know, it, it out there, and it can grow to a huge tree, right? So you just need a small amount of faith. And then there are times we think, well, you know, God will certainly do these things for other people, but He probably wouldn't do those things for me. Listen, God is not a respecter of person. And I'm telling you, according to the Bible, according to the Word of God, Jesus is saying yes to your promise, all right? 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20 says this, for all the promises of God. Wait a minute, does it say some of them? For some of the promises of God, all the promises of God in Him, in who? In Jesus are yes and in him amen to the glory of god come on i think jesus deserves a hand of praise amen he's saying yes he's saying yes and secondly god cannot lie to you about a promise now here's the thing about the world that we live in right people lie all the time am i right do it do i have a witness today people lie employers lie employees lie Politicians, well, I won't even go there, okay? I mean to tell you, you know, even people that are close to us sometimes give us some version of the truth. How many of you know truth doesn't have a version, right? Okay, all right. And how many of you know that men lie, women lie, children lie? It's just human nature, right? And we know that the devil, he's a liar. That's, he, that's the language that he speaks. That he speaks his native language. And so in reality, we're kind of programmed just in the world that we live in to believe that when somebody promises something that it may not happen, that it probably Probably is not going to be fulfilled, right? But I want to tell you something. It's impossible for God to lie. It goes against his very nature and who he is. This is what the word says. Hebrews 6 and verse 18 says, and I'm reading out the new contemporary version. I like that version, how it puts it so plain. It says, these two things cannot change. God cannot lie when he makes a promise. Wow, God cannot lie when he makes a promise, and he cannot lie when he makes an oath. These things encourage us who come to God for safety. They give us strength to hold on to the hope that we've been given. How many of you have grabbed a hold of some hope today? You're holding on to the promise, and you're believing the Lord, knowing this, that God cannot tell a lie. Oh, amen. Numbers 23 tells us this. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and he will he not do, or has he spoken, and will he 
not make it good. I'm telling you, if God said it, we can believe it, and that settles it, all right? And so what we have to understand is that these promises that we're going to look at in the next four weeks, they're not for somebody else. They're for you. They're for me. They're not for the church down the street, okay? They're, they're, they're not for the church out in California. No, they're for us. They're for you and for me. The promises of God are for us. How many of you are ready to receive a promise? Amen? All right, let me give you this word today. The first promise we're going to look at is found in Matthew 16 and verse 18. Let me just read it to you because we're going to dissect this whole verse today. It says this, And I also say that you are Peter, and on this rock, and this is the promise I want to give you today, it says, I will build my church and the gates of hell. This version says Hades. I'm a little King James at times. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Come on. The gates of hell will not prevail. And some of you might be thinking, well, why is that a promise that I should believe? I mean, you know, you know what do I care if the church is built? Uh, you know, someone might think, you know, this is a great verse for all y'all pastors. And, uh, you know, y'all want your church to grow. And how many every pastor wants his church to grow? Sure, indeed. And it is an encouragement for pastors. But I'll have you know, this is not just for pastors to lay hold of. This is for every single believer to lay hold of, believing that God is going to build his church. Do you want to know why? It makes your efforts and my efforts worth something it makes we've just taken up an offering and many of you gave in that offering it makes your giving have value for eternity amen it makes our investment in the kingdom when we give to missions something that even can transcend the very age that you and i live in and so this promise is important to every single believer right because you are the church right i will build my church you are the church all right and we're part of the church that he's building now I want you to understand Jesus didn't say I will build my Christian school all right okay if you got a Christian school I've got no problem with that more power to you You didn't say I'll build my denomination right uh, some of those things are necessary and he certainly didn't say well I will build my church building how many of you know that this church is not the building we can look around, we see sheetrock, and we got some lights, and we got sound systems. That is not the church. Look at the people sitting next to you. That is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? People are what matters to the Lord, all right? And so let's just take a look at this verse really closely today. And we're going to examine it kind of like phrase by phrase, word by word. And the first thing Jesus said here in this promise was the word, I. I. Uh, I didn't promise to build this church. Jesus promised to build his church. This promise was made by the second person of the Trinity. And the scripture says this about him, that in him dwelt all the fullness of God. Wow. This is God making a promise, right? Uh, he's not only the Lord of the harvest, but He's Lord of heaven and the earth. And so I want us to just take a look at one small scene in the Word today in Revelation chapter 5 to take a look at this word, I, all right? And we're, what, what's happening here in Revelation 5 is through John's eyes, John the Revelator, we're beholding heaven, the throne room of God, and, 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 and we're seeing all of that transformation Inspire, and John looks at God, the Father, and he sees that in his hand, as he's seated on the scroll, on the throne, God has a scroll in his hand. And that scroll represents the unfolding of the end of history and the destiny of the church of Jesus Christ. And at first, no one is found that is worthy to open the scroll, right? It seems like no one is worthy to bring history to its appointed consummation. And John weeps that nobody is found that's worthy to open the scroll. But finally, one of the elders finds John there. And he tells John, he says, look, do not weep. Behold, in other words, look at the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And the scripture tells us that John looked and behold in the midst of the throne in the midst of the living creatures that are circling about the throne and in the midst of the 24 elders there stood a lamb as 
though it had been slain, and this lamb is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, how many of you know that the lamb and the lion is Jesus? Come on. Aren't you grateful for Jesus? This is the one who made you and me the promise that he was going to build his church, all right? And what happens as John puts his eyes upon Jesus and Jesus walks over, the lamb like a lion, the lion like a lamb, walks over and takes that scroll out of the hands of God to open up those seals, all of heaven begins to erupt, right? Revelation 5 verse 9, a song begins to birth to burst forth and they begin to sing for you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nations and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. You say, well, pastor, who are they singing about and who are they singing to? Come on. They're singing to the one who made you and me the promise that he was going to build his church. Amen. And so here's the thought today. If heaven recognizes him as the supreme one worthy of adoration and praise, if heaven rejoices in the cross, in the blood of Jesus, in his redeeming power, shouldn't we? Come on. I'm here today to tell you that it is going to happen. Amen. Come on. Somebody give the Lord a big hand of praise today. And if you continue to read the chapter, it's absolutely incredible. There's like this huge crescendo of praise in heaven with tens of thousands upon thousands of angels. There were the elders. There were the voices of the four living creatures. And even the scripture tells us that the creatures in the earth, the things that creep upon the earth, all right, the things that fly above the earth, the stuff that lives inside of the earth, all of these creatures began to worship and to praise and to sing glory to God. Come on, that's the very one that said, I will build my church. Amen? Come on, we can be rest assured that if all of creation praises Him, if all of heaven recognizes Him, if even the birds and the bees and the, and the lions and the lambs and the, well, I don't know what lives underneath the ground, the moles and the shrews and the earthworms praise Him. Come on, we need to thank God that that's the one who made us a faithful promise. He said, I will build my church. 